Good morning. You guys are very spread out this morning. You're going to give me whiplash. I'm just warn you now. I'm sorry if I just get bored halfway through and ignore one half of you. Um, we'll see who looks best. That's how you'll know. But um, We're in the middle of our Relatable Faith series. If this is your first time with us, welcome. Um, we're looking at people in the Bible who may be in totally different contexts to anything that we will ever experience. But actually, they live out their relationship with God in ways that are really significant, in ways that we can learn from, and in ways that definitely... Ha, ha, ha definitely relate to us today Um, and so far Butters has looked at Priscilla and Aquila he said that they were people who were willing to be grafting givers risky relocators and caring connectors and then Matt looked at Caleb he talked about Caleb being a man with a godly optimism combined with patience and perseverance and as a result he saw fear overcome in the name of the Lord and then last week CB was looking at Hannah a woman who had to bring her real, genuine, severe grief and suffering to God, trusting that he was the Lord of armies and he was faithful and he was good. And today we, we arrive at two men, two men who were not willing to settle for the cultural narrative that is prevailing around them. And two men who were not willing to settle for the circumstances that people in their culture are facing. And so straight away, before we go any further, I'd like to think there's a few people who feel that relates to them already. I hope there's a few people in this room who think, I am not satisfied with the culture around me that is prevailing. I am not satisfied with the circumstances that people face in my life that I see. I'm not satisfied with it. I'm not okay with it. If you're feeling that way this morning, if you're upset, if you're angry, if you're just desperate to see a change in the narrative of our culture, then I think there's something here in this story for us. And I think God would say, just be ready. Just be ready for how I want to use you for my plans and my purposes. I choose to work through my people. It's something that I've done all throughout history. It's something that I'm going to go on doing. I choose to work through individuals who are in a relationship with me. So be ready. Be ready to be used. I want to see my kingdom advance more than you do. (laughs) I want to see my kingdom advance with your friends and your families and your workplaces and your city and beyond. So be ready. Um, So I'd love to just pray. We're We're going to jump straight into God's words. We're in 1 Samuel 13. If you want to, I'll give you a little moment to find that while I'm praying. Um, It's quite a big chunk of scripture. I think we've got it on the screen as well. Um, But Lord, as we open your words, we just thank you for it, Lord God. We thank you for your word given to us, Lord Jesus. And I just pray, Lord, as we open this, would we, would we just be cut to the heart like, you, like your word promises you can do, Lord Jesus? Would you convict us? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us, Lord God? Would you speak what you want to speak to us this morning, Lord? I pray that any words of man would just blow away, Lord God, and only what you want would remain. Just come and have your way amongst us, Lord. Amen. So we're in 1 Samuel 13. We're starting at verse 16, and we're going right the way through to 14, 15. It's a big chunk. Okay, here we go. Saul and his son Jonathan and the men with them were staying in Gibeah of Benjamin while the Philistines camped outside at Michmash. I'm owning that as being called Michmash. I don't know if that's true, but I like it. It does sound scouse, doesn't it? Camping outside at Michmash. Um, Raiding parties went out from the Philistine camp in three detachments. One turned towards Ophrah in the, vic- in the vicinity of Shual and another towards Beth Haron and the third towards the borderlands overlooking the valley of Zeboim facing the wilderness. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel because the Philistines had said, well, otherwise the Hebrews, they'll make swords and they'll make spears. So all of Israel had to go down to the Philistines to have their plowshares, their mattocks, their axes and their sickles sharpened. The price was two thirds of a shekel for sharpening plowshares and mattocks and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. So on the day of battle, Not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or a spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them, no one else. So a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass at Michmash. And one day Jonathan, son of Saul, said to his young armour bearer, Come, let's go over to the Philistine outpost on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying on the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree in Magron. With him were about 600 men, among whom was a hydra who was wearing an ephod. He was the son of Ichabod's brother, Atiub, or, yeah, sure, son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh. No one was aware that Jonathan had left. And on each side of the pass that Jonathan intended to cross to reach the Philistine outpost was a cliff. One was called Bozes, and the other was called Senna. One cliff stood to the north towards Michmash, and the other to the south towards Geba. 
And Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on, her, on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. Do all that you have in mind, his armor bearer said. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. Great statement. I am with you, heart and soul. Very epic. And Jonathan said, come on then, we will cross over to them and let them see us. And if they say to us, wait there until we come to you, then we will stay where we are and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, we will climb up because that will be our sign that the Lord has given them into our hands. So both of them showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. I think of it as a bit like a kid playing hide and seek. Boo, do you know what I mean? It just says, look, here we are. They showed themselves to the Philistine outpost. Look, said the Philistines, the Hebrews are crawling out of the holes that they are hiding in. The men of the outpost shouted up to Jonathan and his armor bearer, come up to us and we'll teach you a lesson. So Jonathan said to his armor bearer, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind him. And the Philistines fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer followed, killing people behind. In that first attack, attack, Jonathan and his armor bearer killed some 20 men in an area of about half an acre. And then panic struck the whole army, those in the camp and those in the field, and those in the outposts and the raiding parties, and the ground shook. It was a panic sent by God. Three things that I want to talk about this morning. They're not statements, they're questions. I hope that's okay. I don't think they're things that I am necessarily going to provide an answer for. I think they're things that I'd love to come before God with. I think there's a heart to be cultivated. There's something to be grappled with to then bring before God and say, okay, what does that look like in my context? Because it's totally different for all of us. It's going to be totally different for all of us. So my three questions are this. How do we use what we have to see God's kingdom advance? I'll say it again in case you're a note taker. How do we use what we have to see God's kingdom advance? My second question is, what lengths are we willing to go to knowing it's all in his strength? So what lengths are we willing to go to knowing it's all in his strength? And then lastly, will we get on board with vision? Shorter one. Will we get on board with vision? So how do we use what we have to see God's kingdom advance? Let's not mince words. The Israelites are in a dire position when we arrive in these passages, it's really not a good time. They have previously seen their God do amazing things. They've seen God provide for them in truly amazing, miraculous ways, but ultimately they've arrived at a place where they are no longer putting their trust in him as king. They're not putting their trust in God as king anymore. And they're looking around and they're seeing all these other groups of people. And the Bible says, they've got a king. He like rides out in front of them on battle. We want that, that looks good. That looks powerful, we want that. So they say, give us a king. And Saul ends up being appointed king over the people. And the first couple of years, it goes okay. But as is often the result when people decide for themselves what is good (laughs) and cease to place their trust in God, eventually sin creeps in. And it all goes wrong. And Saul's kingdom begins to crumble before his very eyes. And as a result, the Israelites, they, they find themselves back again in the hands of oppression. This time, by their own design, <laughs> by their own choices, by their own, their own desires, they have ended up in the hands of oppression. In fact, so dire is the situation, they're not even allowed to have blacksmiths. They don't have blacksmiths because their enemy think, well, then they'll be powerful. <laughs> then they'll make swords. We don't want them to have that ability, so no blacksmiths for you. And they have to go to their enemies. They have to beg and grovel and pay an extortionate fee just to have their farming tools sharpened, never mind end up with any weapons that they could use in battle. They've put themselves in a really powerless situation and the soldiers, as a result, have no tools to fight with, none whatsoever. And I think there's some, there's some parallels for us today. Um, just before we go into some of the specifics, I think all too often we find that we cease to place our trust in God. All too often we find that we put our trust in pretty much anything else we can possibly find sometimes. And actually we invite these things into our lives. We invite these things into our heart. We give them permission to rule and to reign over them. And we willingly step back into a yoke of slavery. We willingly place ourselves under things that were not what God wanted for us in the first place. It's a relatable situation, sometimes on a personal level, sometimes on a church level, sometimes on a national level. This is something that we do when we take our eyes off of God. And we end up in powerless situations. But Jonathan and his armor bearer, they knew all of this. Neither of them are ignorant about the state of Israel. Neither of, the, neither of them are men who don't really know what's going on. They're there. They're living it. 
They've got feet on the ground. They are full well aware. They're on the front lines. They see all of the desperation around them. They see the full reality of the situation. And yet, it is their response that will go on to dictate the course of these events. It is their response that will go on to dictate what happens for an entire nation of people. It's not the circumstances that are going to dictate this. It's not the explainable overwhelming, difficult circumstances caused by the Israelites themselves through sin. It's not that that's going to go and dictate these situations. It's two blokes, two men. They're going to be the ones, two men with a heart after God, two men with a heart saying, we want your will, Lord, not our will. Two men with godly intent are going to be at the root of how this story plays out. And Jonathan, he looks around He sees his entire people under this yoke of oppression. He sees his father's kingdom, not his heavenly father, but literally his father Saul. He sees his kingdom and his reputation crumbling before him. And he sees a group of soldiers totally unequipped. Like, we're not making this up. They don't have swords. They are completely unequipped to face what is about to come before them. And he responds with, but. But. I see all that. I'm not ignorant of it. But I have a sword and a God who is good. And that's Jonathan's response. I have a sword and a God who is good. He knows his heavenly father is the one who places people in circumstances and situations so that he may use them to his glory. And Jonathan sees all of this and says, but I have a sword and a God who is good. It's, it's a heart posture that we see all throughout the Bible. We, we heard about David briefly this morning already when he, when he hears of Goliath. This, you know, it's not that people were exaggerating how big Goliath was. He was huge. Like, he was an absolute tank. It's not that people got into hysteria and were falsely worrying. He was a massive bloke, trained as a warrior since youth, equipped for battle. It says that, like, his, the, the spear tip on the end of his spear, just the tip of the spear, was like three kilograms, four kilograms, just on the end. Like, he was a crazy big dude. And David hears that no one in the entire nation of Israel is willing to challenge this man. And David, the young shepherd boy, says, yeah, yeah, I see all that. I see the sword. I see his massive head. I see how scary he is. But... I have a sling and a God who is good. When Jesus is faced with 5,000 men, never mind women and children, just 5,000 men plus whatever the women and children would be in, who have traveled to hear him teach, who have traveled to be in his presence, and he realizes they haven't got enough food to look after themselves. It's not something they're capable of doing. They can't just go to the co-op. It's not an option. It's not something they're going to be able to do. These people need looking after, and the disciples come and they reiterate this point. They say, Jesus, we've not got enough food what are we going to do? And he says, go and feed them. And he goes, no, 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 you, no, you don't get it. We don't have enough food. You must have misheard me the first time. And Jesus says, no, I see all that, but I have two loaves, five fish, and a father who's good. And then Paul and Silas in Acts, they get arrested for their faith. They get arrested for proclaiming the name of Jesus. They get flogged, beaten to within an inch of their life, stripped naked, placed in the innermost jail cell of this place that was reserved only for those who you wanted to rob all freedom, all liberty, all hope, everything from. You wanted to take everything away from them and put them in this place. And they are surrounded by other people who are completely hopeless, completely powerless, in no position to do anything whatsoever. And they see all of that. They're not ignorant of it. And they say, but we have joy and a God who is good. This is a heart posture that we see all throughout the Bible. I think it's really, really important. How do we take what we have? Whatever it may be, whatever little it may be, how do we take what we have and use it, give it to God so that his kingdom would be advanced? How do we be those people who look around and see it all and say, but, but? And I just feel, you might even be in the room this morning saying, I've got nothing. I haven't got two loaves. I haven't got any of these things. I've got, I've got nothing that I can bring to this situation. Can I just encourage you to look no further than the armor bearer? He didn't have a sword. He was totally swordless, but he was able to say, but he has a sword and we have a God who is good. Seriously, he saw what, how God had equipped his brother instead. He saw how God had equipped this man close to him and he said, that's God's will and this is good. This is good. We must do this thing. You know, we need to be a people who see the direness of the situation. We don't, we're not called to be an ignorant people. I don't think that's our call. We need to be those who understand the issues of the world. I'm not talking about false optimism. I'm not talking about having a stiff upper lip or any of that sort of stuff. It's okay to acknowledge that the world is in a dire situation. That it is in a dire place. It's okay to acknowledge that our society and our culture are in a dire place and that so often the reason for it is explainable, just like the Israelites. It's sin. It's lost 
broken, hopeless people trying to decide what is good and what is bad. And as a result, we end up in awful situations. It's an explainable thing. But we need to see the reality of this as God's people and respond with, but we have this and a God who is good. And if you're not sure what the this is this morning, if you don't know what to respond with, you know, if, if in the algebraic equation, what is X? <laughs> what am I responding with? I just feel really provoked. It's his word. I, th- I think that's, that's going to be really important for us, that we are a people who say, but I have his word and I know that he is good. I have his word that is alive and active, that is sharper than any double-edged sword, that separates and pierces bone and marrow. When society is increasingly saying morally corrupt things, Whatever it is, whatever the thing you've been provoked by in your heart, whether it's how you should spend your finances, whether it's sexuality and marriage, whether it's whatever the hot topic of the day is, it doesn't matter. We have his word and a God who is good. When we see society, we see all this stuff leaking in. We even know what they're teaching our kids in schools. We're not meant to be ignorant about this stuff. We're not meant to suppose, just pretend it's not happening, but we do get to say, but we have his word and a God who is good. We're not powerless. We're not... He's, he's equipped us with what we need. <laughs> and I believe that's really important. I, I speak to people my age. I'm looking over there. You guys are younger than me, if I'm perfectly honest. But I think that's really important for us. I think increasingly we need to be those who say, but we have his word. We know what he says and we know that he is good. Because ultimately we have two choices really about how we respond to these situations. One of them is the Jonathan approach. The other one is the other person who had a sword in this situation. Saul. He had a sword, he wasn't swordless, but depending on the translation you read, he either hid in a cave or under a pomegranate tree. Do you know what I mean? We have two options. I'm not, I'm not trying to condemn, there's not, none of that in there this morning, but what are we going to respond with? Are we going to be a people who say, but, or a people who say, ah, it's, it's all too big. It's all too big. No, we want to say, but we have this. <laughs> and a God who is good. So second thing, what lengths are we willing to go to knowing that it's all in his strength? So I'm, I'm, I'm so struck by the weight of this decision for Jonathan and the armor bearer. It is not an easy task (laughs) to undertake. Let's not pretend that this is a simple thing that they are gonna do. It's not casual, it's not a flippant decision. Rather, it's the result of a heart that knows who it serves and is desperate to see God move. And there's this word, um, it says perhaps in the NIV in 14.6, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. If you're reading from the ESV this morning, it says it may be that the Lord will work for us I don't know how you read that. I think there's a danger of thinking it's quite haphazard, almost like it's said with a shrug, perhaps the Lord will work on our heart. It may be that we will die or we will not die. You know, it can sound quite casual. I do not think that's the case. I don't think that's the tone with which this is expressed. I don't think it implies doubt. I think instead it simply shows that Jonathan full well understands that what he is suggesting What he is aiming for is not within his own power in the first place. It depends upon God. He expected success not from his own merits, not from anything other than the fact that he has a powerful God in heaven. And it's part of God's goodness to us. Like, Look at how he draws us into positions of trusting him. Look at how he draws us into places where we have to learn to trust him. He places burdens on our hearts that do not make sense. And that's the point. It's not meant to make sense. We must be those who step out. We must be those who, when we've, ha- we've got that burden, but I do not see your provision yet, Lord, I will step out. We must be those who trust that he will provide all we need for the purposes that he calls us to. Because just being real, what Jonathan is suggesting is foolishness. It is really stupid. Like it is a, a categorically bad idea. You would not find anyone other than that armor bearer, I'm willing to bet, who would agree with Jonathan. Yeah, you, sh- you two should go. <laughs> You two should go and do this. No one is going to say that is a good idea because it isn't. It's a bad idea in human terms. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. They have to start off, just start off. Does anyone like climbing mountains? I've done a couple in my lifetime. They they took it out of me a little bit, two in a row with swords and armour and all that so you can go and fight. That doesn't sound like a fun thing. (laughs) That doesn't sound like something I want to do over weekends. The first cliff, it's called Bozes. It means slippery and shiny so not only not only can your foot not really find somewhere to stand but the sun reflects into your eyes and you can't see where you're going so it's slippy and you can't see great start the next cliff is called senna now you can translate that a few different ways but it it means thorny ultimately so it could mean it was covered in thorn bushes or it could mean the landscape itself was sharp 
Like it was likely to cut you if you put your hands to try and climb. And then they make it through that. Well done, lads. They arrive at the Philistine camp and it's proven, it's confirmed that the very thing you are doing is ridiculous because their military enemies do not even feel threatened by their presence. They don't react. They don't sound the alarm. They don't panic and go, two men are here, we must fight them. They don't draw their swords. They don't so much as even move other than to look at them and go, what are you doing? I come up here and we'll teach you a lesson. You idiots, we're going to batter you. There's loads of us. Like, I mean, this is stupid. What on earth are you doing? This is absolutely ridiculous. Now, little do they know that that was God's very sign. <laughs> that was the sign the men knew meant that they'd been given into God's hands. So surely that's it, right? They've made the hard journey. They've been mocked and they've arrived there and they've heard God's confirmation. Great, so now we get to go home, right? We, we did the right thing. We get to go home. No, there's still more hard work to do. <laughs> Even when God confirms that they are on the right path, there's still more to do. It says in verse 12 and 13, climb up after me. The Lord has given them into the hands of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up using his hands and his feet with his armor bearer right behind them. And then they go on and strike down the Philistines and see God move. Like you've arrived, they're elevated from you, mocking you, and you climb up on your hands. It's ridiculous. It just is. It's absolutely absurd. It's crazy levels of effort. And of course, these are men who are, they're acting out of a confidence of who God is. Absolutely they are. But nonetheless, it required some seriously hard graft. It needed physical toil. It needed some really hard work. I just felt provoked. Am I up for that this morning? Are we up for that this morning? We know full well it's only him who saves. We know full well that everything we do is in his strength. But nonetheless, <laughs> what lengths are we willing to go to that he may move through us? This was all in God's strength. They still had to do it. They still had to climb. They still had to fight. They still had to be mocked. You know, we want to be people who, when we have that burden, when we have that godly burden, when he places that thing on our hearts that do not make sense, that burden will, that it will require us to go. It will require us to traverse the rough terrain. It will require us to overcome the temptation to give up and turn back. It will require us to face mockery. It will require us to climb up hand and feet, whatever that means in your circumstances. We want to be people who say, we'll go, Lord. We'll go. We'll do it. If it means seeing you move amongst my friends, amongst my family, amongst my colleagues, my neighbours, my city, my nation, then we will go. We will go the distance. We will do it, Lord. I want more of that heart in my life. Like imagine the amount of opportunities these two men would have had to turn back. Like surely after the first, like the slippy and the shiny, <laughs> surely that's enough. You, tra you traverse that and then turn back. No, okay, the sharp bit. And then you get a mock, like the opportunities they would have had to turn back and they resisted them. And as a result, God's able to move in incredible ways. And then lastly, will we get on board with vision? You know, following... Um, <laughs> following someone else's lead can be a really difficult thing to do. Anyone agree with that in the room? Yeah. Thank goodness. Okay. I remember being told the story by um, our dear brother Slavic. Some of you have met Slavic. And he tells the story of a young man. And this man's growing up and he meets this beautiful woman from a nearby village. Oh my goodness. She's the most beautiful woman he's ever seen. He cannot get over it. And he thinks, I think I, think I want to marry her. I think she's the one, but that feels like a really big decision. I don't know what to do. So he goes to his dad and he says, dad, I've met this woman. She's so beautiful. You have to see her. I think I want to marry her. What should I do? And the dad says, son, thank you so much for coming to me. Thank you for letting me speak this into your life. I think you've got a God who's good. I think you've got a God who loves you. I think you've got a God who, who knows what's best for you and you, you need to trust in him. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to saddle up your horse. And I want you to get on your horse and leave our village. And son, you know full well, when you leave our village, there's two forks in the road. You can either go left and that will take you to the village where that beautiful woman is, or you can go right and it will take you elsewhere. Here's what I want you to do, son. When you approach that fork, just let go of the reins. God will send the horse the right way. Just, just trust in him. Just, just let go of the reins. And the son goes, oh, thank you. I, I feel relieved of the weight of this decision. And he gets up and he saddles his horse and he goes outside and the horse starts walking. You can see the junction in the distance. Oh, heart's pounded a little bit now. This is the moment. This is the moment I'm going to find out. Does God, does God want me to marry this woman or not? Is this going to happen? Is this something he's got in his plan for me? And his heart's really pumping. The horse is starting to trot. It starts to canter. And he gets to the junction. He sees the way left towards this beautiful woman. He sees the way right to the other village. And he gets there and he closes his eyes and he says, your will, not my will, Lord. Your will, not my will. And pulls the horse to the left. <laughs> I don't know if you can relate to that sense that it's really hard to follow someone else's lead when we come with our own agendas 
Because we all do. We all come with our own agendas to everything that we ever face. <laughs> and even when we think we're following, sometimes we aren't. And you know, there are some young, there's some young fishermen on the Sea of Galilee, and they're casting out their nets. And this man called Jesus approaches them and he says, stop what you're doing. Come, follow me. Lay down your nets. I want to make you fishers of men instead. And they're faced with this decision, what should we do? What should we do? Is this man worth following? Is he worth leaving everything behind? Is he, is he worth giving up all that I have and following him? And that same question is there for all of us this morning. Jesus says to all of us by name, come, come follow me. Leave your plans. Mine are better anyway, I promise. <laughs> I really do promise my plans are better. But leave what you have behind and come and follow me. And for many of us in the room, we've made that decision. We've said, do you know what, Lord? Yes, you're beautiful. You're glorious. You're worthy of it all. I will lay down what I have and I will follow you. You are worth following. And as a result, we enter into this relationship from a position of following already. It's something that our hearts do. It's something that we, we've chosen to do. But then often what God does is he places his plans, he places his will, he places his desire in the heart of those around us. And we are given this opportunity to discern God's will, God's plans and God's purposes working out through other people in our lives. And we have a choice, will we follow? Will we get on board when God gives vision to my brothers and my sisters? Will I get on board with both feet? Jonathan's armour bearer, he, he's seen all the same situations as Jonathan. He knows the difficulties that the people are facing. He knows the risks and the dangers involved with trying to traverse over Slippy and, uh, Slippy and Shiny or whatever it was. He knows all the risks. And Jonathan turns to him in verse six and he says, come, let's go over to the outpost of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf because nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. And he's faced with this moment. He's faced with a decision. It's not an inconsequential decision. It's huge. It's massive. Um, it just makes me think, any Lord of the Rings fans in the house? Anyone? Yeah, a couple? I love Lord of the Rings. And I can't help but think of Frodo and Sam. This sort of vibe, you know, traversing the cliffs, brothers in arms. Frodo has this impossible quest in front of him and Sam gets on board. He shares the burden with him. It's absolutely beautiful. It's fantastic. Anyone who's a fan of Lord of the Rings will agree, if you're a true fan, that Sam is the real hero of the story. Yes? Thank you. Oh, yes, he definitely is. No gasps at that. But as much as I love Lord of the Rings, it's a story. It's written by a person. It's based on, based on things that he's experienced. I believe it's inspired by the spirit. We know that Tolkien knew the Lord, but it's a story. It is a story. This is not. This is a real human being. This is a man faced with a decision. Will you risk your life or will you not? Will you get on board with what I think God's telling or will you not? It's a real moment. We can sometimes think, oh, well, it's already scripted. We know what he's going to do. No, this, this happened. <laughs> this was a moment. He saw the two pass before him and he had to decide, what am I going to do? And we hear his response in verse seven. Do all that you have in mind. Go ahead. I am with you, heart and soul. What a great response. I am with you, heart and soul. And from this moment on, the whole rest of the story is plural. It says, Jonathan and the armor bearer went. Jonathan and the armor bearer showed themselves to the Philistine peekaboo. Jonathan and the armor bearer climbed up hands and feet. Jonathan went on slaying the Philistines and the armor bearer followed behind him, slaying as well. It becomes plural. The armor bearer gets to take full part in this vision because he responded, I am with you. <laughs> I am with you, heart and soul. This isn't biblical bromance. They're not just good pals. The armor bearer, the armor bearer sorry, has discerned that Jonathan, you are a man worth following. You're someone who is seeking God's heart. You're seeking the advancement of his kingdom. You're hearing his vision. And actually Jonathan's actions model that reality through the lengths that he is willing to go to and the sacrifices he is willing to make to see God's kingdom advance. It's not just words. He shows it with his life. His life models what he's saying. And I just, I just, I feel like there's many, this is, this is biblical, I don't know why I'm pulling this face, it's perfectly biblical, it just might not be part of this message, but there's many who will say, I'm all about seeing God's kingdom advance. There's, there's many who will say, I'm all about seeing people discipled into, into all they can be in Jesus. There's many who will say, oh, I just want to give Jesus all the glory. And either because they're unaware of their own heart position, or they intentionally have other agendas, that is not true. 
There are people, the Bible tells us, they will be false teachers. There are people who will claim they are following the way, the truth, and the life, and they are not. And we need to be those who by knowing the Holy Spirit, by knowing our loving Father in heaven, by knowing Jesus the Son who died and rose again, that we would have all that we have, the freedom that we have. We need to be those who can discern his will and say, I am with you, heart and soul, and we detect it. And actually, this is, this is the reason the armor bearer is able to reply with such a strong statement. He's, you know, he doesn't say, go on, I'll do it for the bands. <laughs> he says, I am with you, heart and soul. He's all in. He's seeing that, that word that you're saying now, that thing that you're expressing, that's the God I know. That's the God I know working out through another one of his people who is servant-hearted. And if I get on board with this, God will be glorified. So I'm in. I'm in heart and soul. I've not given you anything practical to work with. I've not told you anything to do any, with any of this. I apologize for that, but I'd love, if we've got time, I know we're on a bit of an early finish today, but if we've got time, I'd love to just come before God in worship and say, Lord, let me get them rather than misquoting them. How do I use what I have for your kingdom, Lord Jesus? How do I be someone who goes the distance, knowing it's in your strength? This isn't like a pride thing, but how do I go the distance, knowing it's in your strength? And Lord, help me to discern your vision and get on board. Get on board. I don't want to be a stumbling block for anyone, but equally, Lord, I want to protect your people well. <laughs> I want to follow your vision, not someone else's. How do I get on board with your vision, Lord God? And just in the worship this morning as well, I think there's some people here who need to just absolutely ignore everything I've said because your heart's really hurting. Specifically today, this isn't like a, a general thing. There's something today. I might have even upset you by talking this morning. It might have been because what I said was rubbish. <laughs> um, but... I do, I just think there's a couple of people, your heart's really hurt, and, and we've got to be packed away today by sort of one-ish, but we don't have to be out of this room. We've got this room till whenever. I'd love you just to pray. If you, if you feel, do you know what? My heart is really hurting this morning. I can't really take anything in. I'm just, I'm just full. Do you know what I mean? I'm just, I'm just full to the brim. There's no room. <laughs> I need to spill some of this out. God says, I am a safe place for that. I am a safe place for that. We're not looking for an emotional reaction, but whatever that means for you, I think, you know, like we were saying, lay it all down. There's some people who just need to do that as well. Um, I'm going to point at someone who's going to pray with you. Is that okay? Because otherwise, sometimes it doesn't happen. So I'd love to name Pete's up for praying. Chris is up for praying. Chris is up for praying. I think Ram and Sadie are up for praying as well. I think some of our students at the back, I think you guys are up for praying as well. Um, I think Kathy's up for praying. Sorry, I'm just picking people. I just, I want to equip you. Go and grab someone. If this is you, go and grab someone. Um, and I think John's up for praying with people as well, if you'd like to, mate. But go and grab any of those people. You don't even have to tell them what it is. You can just say, do you know what? I'm full. My heart's hurting. I need to pour some stuff out.